Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. In our day-to-day -day clinical practice, one of the most common questions we get from our patients is what lifestyle modifications can we do to decrease the risk of this cancer coming back, especially now when there's so much hype around different types of diets decreasing or increasing risk of cancer. How much is bias skewing our results here? What about other confounding factors? To unpack all this, we're joined by Dr. Neil Iyengar, a medical oncologist with a keen interest in nutrition and exercise from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Neil, welcome. Before we dive into any of this, I want to thank you for sharing your slide deck as we have cherry picked some of the few key slides here for our discussion today. Okay, let's get started. We know that patient with history of any cancer, we have to, in fact, worry about cancer recurrence. And of course, any new cancer development in this particular patient as well. Outside pharmacological adjuvant treatment options, what evidence do we truly have for addition of any nutritional diet or exercise, which, and these interventions, are they truly resulting into decreased risk for recurrence at all? Yeah, that's such an important question, and this is an area of a lot of active research. Uh, we know as a whole that cancer survivors are at significantly increased risk for developing long-term cardiometabolic complications, uh, either directly related to their cancer or as a result of cancer therapy. Now, the question you asked was specific to the role of diet or exercise uh, in preventing cancer recurrence. And this is where we currently have mixed evidence where in some cancers and some circumstances, we do see anti-cancer activity related to exercise and related to certain dietary patterns. Uh, but certainly the anti-cancer activity of diet and exercise uh, is something that we're still learning about. Uh, and ongoing trials, we hope, will address this with uh, real evidence uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank you for setting that for the stage, Neil. One big problem that we run into when we're looking at these studies is BMI. BMI is not the best marker in guesstimating one's activity or how healthy they are. But this is a measure that is frequently used in these studies. Here, another study from 2016 looked at risk of different cancers based on BMI. Your thoughts here? Yes, this is such an important point. Um, we know that generally speaking, exercise and diet is a good thing for our overall health. But when we start to wield exercise and, and diet as, as precision medicine type tools, where we're prescribing them or we're prescribing specific dietary or exercise approaches, this is where we need to also become more precise in our risk stratification. And I'm talking about metabolic risk stratification. BMI is certainly a useful tool at the population level in terms of understanding population health. But when we get to the individual level, this is where BMI starts to so show some problems. I do think that BMI is a good starting point, even at the individual level. And for those individuals who are in the obese range BMI, the vast majority, over 90% of these individuals are at increased risk, not only for multiple cardiometabolic uh, problems in the future, but also for uh, cancer recurrence. That being said, we also know that a significant proportion of individuals with a normal BMI, if you will, still have cardiometabolic risk or cancer-associated cardiometabolic risk. And that's where we need to use more precise tools for risk stratification, such as body composition uh, or circulating metabolic markers. Thanks for covering that. One can't stress the importance of these tools, especially diet and exercise. And now we know that this aids to the physical conditioning. So patients, in fact, do better when they're on systemic therapy and they have better quality of life. But this, does it translate into overall survival benefit? I know breast cancer trials have focused into answering some of these questions, but do we have any consensus on this? This is uh, an area, again, of active research. Um, we certainly know from observational studies 
uh, that higher levels of physical activity and diets that are high in fruit and vegetable intake and low in processed food intake are associated uh, with increased overall survival. And we think that's largely driven by a reduction uh, in cardiometabolic events like MIs or diabetes, uh, diabetes or diabetic complications. Now, whether or not there's a cancer specific reduction in mortality, uh, this is where we see more mixed data. And here on this slide, you are essentially seeing some of the completed uh, large phase three trials in the adjuvant setting for breast cancer, uh, and really only two trials so far, the WINS and the WELLS study, have addressed uh, the recurrence-free survival and overall survival endpoints with conflicting results. Both of these trials used a uh, fruit and vegetable forward high fiber intervention, low fat intervention in the dietary intervention arm uh, versus a control arm. And in the WIN study, uh, there was a 24% reduction in the risk of breast cancer recurrence uh, in the low fat uh, diet arm versus the control arm, whereas in the well study, there was no difference in recurrence between the two arms. Now, in post hoc analyses, we think that uh, the, the difference in these trials was related to the degree of weight loss that was observed. There was uh, a greater degree of weight loss observed in the WIND study and essentially no difference or no weight loss observed uh, in the WELL study, which may be driving the null results uh, in the WELL study. The currently ongoing BWELL trial is a very large um, multi-center alliance trial which is addressing this question uh, in a more homogeneous patient population, again, with breast cancer. Uh, and there, that trial is powered to a recurrence uh, endpoint, and so we hope we'll get more definitive data there. For now, I would say that the data allow us to conclude uh, that a high fiber, fruit and vegetable forward, low fat diet is associated with lower cardiometabolic uh, uh, events. Uh, and that drives an overall survival benefit. Whether or not there's a direct anti-cancer benefit remains to be seen. And that is so important before we start to draw any concrete conclusions. And it's also important when we're looking at these observational studies versus the real world analysis, what we run into in the community, there's a huge social economic disparities that's playing a role here. And again, I'm not arguing over the benefit of ongoing physical activity, improving performance status, but selecting particular food groups or diets that can potentially change outcomes, that's just a tough study to do. And right now in my practice, I recommend like consuming processed food, uh, decreasing processed foods or decreasing red meat. But again, these are expensive recommendations for our patients. Neil, here, can you please go over this table and share what concrete evidence we have with these dietary changes? Absolutely. I, I think that's such an important point, Rahul, that you raise with regard to uh, the impact of social determinants of health uh, and the availability of some of these dietary or lifestyle interventions uh, to diverse patient populations. Uh, what you're seeing on this uh, slide here uh, are summary data uh, from a report that the American Institute for Cancer Research puts out uh, and updates every uh, couple of years with the most recent evidence. Now, it is largely based based on observational data, uh, although uh, prospective randomized control trial data is, is heavily weighted when available uh, in these summaries. But essentially, in terms of uh, the effects of specific dietary components, we do see some clear associations from the observational data that have been recapitulated in preclinical studies as well as uh, some initial human trials. So here what you can see is that a diet that is rich in whole grains and fiber is associated with improved outcomes, particularly in colorectal cancer. We're now seeing uh, that similar results in breast cancer, prostate cancer, and others. In melanoma, there is both preclinical and observational data to suggest that uh, immunotherapy is potentiated by high fiber diets and ongoing human trials testing that hypothesis. 
Um, and certainly there are dietary patterns that are detrimental for both overall health and we think for the risk of cancer recurrence. Uh, sugar sweetened beverages, for example, increase the overall uh, energy intake and, and worsen energy balance. There is no safe level of alcohol intake, I'm afraid. Uh, and so that's a balance between quality of life and the risk that people are willing to accept. Uh, certainly processed foods, especially uh, highly processed or, or ultra processed foods like uh, red meats, like pepperonis and salamis and cold cuts uh, have been directly linked to uh, colorectal cancer and several other obesity associated cancers, even in non-obese individuals. So I think this is where I really emphasize overall dietary and eating patterns with my patients where we really strive for diets that are rich in fruits and vegetables. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be organic or any particular type of vegetable or type of fruit. Um, this is really where we start to uh, get into the weeds. What we really need to focus on is that overall dietary pattern. And I recommend that folks aim for an 80% of their diet to be fruit and vegetable based. 20% can come from meats if people do eat meat. And I do recommend lean meats like fish and poultry that are minimally processed. Uh, and some of that data is, is summarized here uh, on this slide. And then of course, minimizing unnecessary or empty caloric intake, if you will, such as sugary beverages uh, and alcohol. Thanks for covering that, Neil. And we'd run into this issue all the time where that is good from a generic standpoint, but when we dive into a prostate cancer specific or CLL patient just asked what I can do to avoid, or even my family for that matter. So how do you go about answering some of those very specific questions? Right, so we, we do hope that some of the research that we're doing will get us to a place where we can provide either disease specific or individual specific or ideally both uh, recommendations for diet and exercise. And this may be based on an individual's microbiome composition, as well as the specific type of cancer therapy that they're going to be receiving. We're just not there yet. And so what we are currently doing in practice is drawing from broader observations that we are we have seen are generally healthy um, with the hope we can make them more specific in the future. So for the examples that you provided, I would say, for example, in prostate cancer, there is strong observational evidence and now growing prospective clinical trial data that processed red meats are associated with an increased risk of recurrence. We also see that in colorectal rectal cancer and starting to see that in, in breast cancer as well. Uh, so certainly that's an area where I would limit processed red meat intake. Um, for CLL or other blood cancers, for example, we're starting to see more and more evidence supporting uh, the importance of high fiber diets uh, in reducing at least a, a pro-metastatic niche, if you will. Uh, and that whether or not that will translate uh, to hard clinical endpoints remains to be be seen, but certainly helps with some of the cardiometabolic uh, long-term sequelae from uh, therapies associated with those cancers. So for now, I again, I think the two highest points to emphasize uh, is a dietary pattern that's predominantly fruit and vegetable intake uh, and a high fiber diet. I even recommend supplementation if need be to attain a goal of about 30 grams of fiber per day. Thanks for stressing the importance of that, and we'll continue to advocate for that when we see uh, our patients and community. Uh, Neil, AICR, that is the American Institute of Cancer Research, also has recommended guidelines around this and has a scoring system. Your thoughts on this? Yes, I think this scoring system uh, is really important because this is one of the few uh, objective scoring or objective methods, if you will, to evaluate uh, lifestyle and lifestyle risk associated with, with cancer. So now there have been uh, several large cohort studies um, which have applied the scoring mechanism uh, and associated uh, better scores, so better dietary and exercise patterns 
patterns with a lower risk of developing multiple different types of cancers, at least 13 different types of cancer. And that scoring system is summarized on, on this slide here. So here are the key features of the AICR uh, lifestyle recommendations uh, to reduce cancer risk, many of which we've discussed, for example, the fiber and, and reduction of red meat and, and sugary beverages, certainly achieving um, uh, physical activity levels that are consistent with ASCO guidelines, such as 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity, has independently been associated with a reduction in cancer risk and a reduced cancer recurrence. But when you put it all together, AICR scoring system has shown now in multiple different uh, independent cohorts uh, that when patients are able to adhere uh, to these guidelines, the risk of developing these cancers goes down significantly. Thank you, Neil. And you've mentioned them, we've covered this again. Our ASCO guidelines also reflect this, addressing obesity, increased physical activity, colorful vegetable diet is the way to go. Neil, before we close, your take home message for our community oncologists and our patients? Well, my take home message is that um, this is an important part, uh, that diet, exercise, lifestyle uh, is an important part of the cancer treatment plan. And we have ample evidence that uh, optimizing lifestyle reduces long term cardiometabolic complications from cancer therapy. We're starting to see evidence that there may be a direct anti-cancer benefit, but we certainly want our, our patients to be cured of their cancer, but not succumb to side effects, long-term side effects of the cancer therapies that we've treated them with. These lifestyle interventions and guidelines are a powerful tool uh, to extend life, at least through optimizing cardiometabolic health, maybe through direct anti-cancer effects uh, as well. There are many resources that are available to help uh, my colleagues in the community uh, achieve and, and, uh, and educate their patients with regard to lifestyle uh, uh, recommendations, several of which are listed uh, on this slide here. And I certainly recommend taking advantage of programs like the Diabetes Prevention Program, the Live Strong Program, uh, as well as now a growing number of apps that are available from academic institutions, uh, as well as some commercial apps that have published evidence in support of their use for weight management, diet management, and exercise management as well. You know, thank you so much for covering such an important, a very, very relevant topic for all community and academic physicians. For our listeners, stay tuned for a short recap. In this discussion with Dr. Neil Iyengar from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, we covered the importance of nutrition and exercise when it comes to cancer and cancer recurrence. We glance over the current recommendations of maintaining healthy weight and limiting the consumption of high calorie foods and beverages. We have evidence that consuming less processed food and limiting alcohol consumption can be good. But let us keep in mind that conducting good diet related prospective studies is very hard as there are a lot of confounding factors here. Making concrete conclusions on one diet being better than the other is unjust. With limited data in hand, we do continue to recommend maintaining optimal body fat and lean mass ratio. With increased incidence of cancer at young age, the diet playing a role in this remains a leading hypothesis. Thanks for joining us. Look out for more practice reinforcing and changing discussions with us. We are the Oncology Brothers.